Professor Kafitz, when you were coming to the writing of your article about the family that does not reproduce itself, what sort of intellectual currents did you find yourself in? Uh, what kind of issues and uh, interactions with other scholars were you involved in at the time that you came to write the article? Well, mostly, I suppose I was influenced by the things I'd been uh, reading uh, rather more than by talking with people. Uh, there was a, a, a literature that had always fascinated me in which there were quite widely different explanations of the fall of fertility. And uh, you may know about the uh, social capillarity of uh, an anthropologist by the name of Dumont, uh, who has been since uh, uh, forgotten, in which people, as they uh, rise economically, uh, tend to have smaller families in the same way that the uh, put tubes in a, uh, in a bowl of water, the viscosity process makes it that the narrow tube will have the higher social, as he interpreted it, uh, rise. And I don't think, I never did think that that explains very much. It's, a, it's an image, and it's the kind of image that helps to keep in mind what's happening, but it really isn't a, an explanation. It's an analogy without being an explanation. Uh, and then the uh, view that uh, people's uh, interests become uh, wider and that uh, it's not so important for them to have uh, uh, children anymore simply because they're thinking of many other things. And there's some element, obviously, of truth in that. Uh, and then the fact that um, uh, women get to working, uh, and th so they have less time for raising children and keeping house, and children come to be more and more in the way, one might almost say, uh, in the style of modern life. So I, I, I noted all those things. I still, I still was interested in having still was very interested in having a, uh, a more clear-cut kind of model. And I think this one by which in the times, the many hundreds of, of years, the many, many centuries in which the uh, human race was evolving, uh, that there was a genetic uh, evolution, of course. We know that from, we know that from biology and probably such genetic changes as the development of the immune system that came in that time. That's probably the, been the principal element in human evolution over uh, historic time. Uh, but uh, I, 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 it seemed to me that that really didn't have very much bearing on fertility as it actually goes on, that what does have a bearing on it is a evolution of, of a culture. The, the way in which uh, cultures are transmitted is analogous to, but has not all that much relation to, uh, the way in which uh, genes are transmitted. Uh, uh, as I say, analogous to is the furthest I would, I would go, although many biologists think it's much more than that. And that is, that is the point at which you would place your idea about uh, the high fertility male dominant societies. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was looking for ways in which uh, fertility could be stimulated. And uh, what uh, I've since done in recent work is to find other kinds of uh, other kinds of data that show how very, very high was the mortality in earlier times. So that fertility had to be. That's right. High for you to survive. That's right, yeah. that's right. Uh, so that, uh, as I was saying the other day, Massimo Levi Bacci, who's very authoritative on such matters, estimates some 17 years expectation of life with maybe 50, 60, 70 percent of children uh, dying before they're, uh, you know, before they're uh, beyond age uh, one or two. Uh, and uh, when you when you have this kind of situation, of course, it's. You've just got to strain everything uh, 
to get to the amount of fertility that will keep the group going. So what I describe is a process of, essentially, of, it's an arithmetic process by which the groups, the human groups that reproduce rapidly, are the ones that are going to survive and are going to be known and whose cultures will be known. It's a selection. That's right, yeah. Uh, that's right. And uh, the Greeks, for instance, the, in, in classical times, must have been very, very prolific. And they spread over the Mediterranean, as you know. They had colonies in Egypt and Italy and mm -hmm. elsewhere. And Greek culture, for that reason, spread around, and Greek customs. Well, I'm not, not much of an authority on Greek customs that have a bearing on childbearing, but whatever, whatever does have a relation to it is going to be, uh, is, is, uh, its spreading is going to result in a, a continuation and increase of that social group. Now, when you were uh, formulating some of these ideas and beginning to write the paper, were you in contact with other scholars? Were you doing this primarily as a solitary work, or what was the context? Well, at that time, I was, uh, I was at Harvard, and there was a population group there, and I certainly did talk to other members of our group. I had a lot of contact with uh, Robert Dorfman, who's a distinguished economist, uh, and uh, with uh, William Alonso, who is more a uh, geographical type, both very interested in population. Peter Rogers, who is an engineering type. So I was talking to people in various disciplines, intelligent people, I strongly believe, aside from the fact that they were authorities in their disciplines. And each of those did have his own explanation of how populations uh, survive and increase and mm -hmm. how why birth rates are high, and then why they become low. Um, I was always up against uh, the people who were surest they knew the answer, the economists. They were surest they knew the answer uh, because they had a very sharp, clear-cut uh, mechanism uh, explaining it that uh, Uh, Liebenstein, Harvey Liebenstein was one of my colleagues at Harvard, and I, uh, uh, he, he certainly was aware, for example, uh, that uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, people become old in primitive villages in, uh, or in peasant societies, uh, they are supported by the children. They can't work any longer in the fields. They're supported by the children. And hence, there's an incentive to have children. An economic incentive. An economic yeah. incentive, yeah. that's right. But I was inclined to turn that around, you can see on my way of looking at it. The reason that uh, the society made it that people were dependent on their children is because it wanted to provide, I'm, I'm putting this in an anthropomorphic form because it all came about through selection, uh, uh, it wanted to provide an incentive to have children. and. Uh, so those societies, for example, in which the old people were provided for by the whole community, would have less incentive to have children, mm -hmm. and hence would be less likely to have their culture continue. Uh, and uh, so, so that my way of looking at it rather turns it upside down yes, from the way in which the standard economy, this has been repeated everywhere, everywhere, everywhere that people uh, have a lot of children because when they uh, grow old, they will then be supported and otherwise mm -hmm. not this But in, a, in an evolutionary sense, it's just the opposite. It's just, that's right. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting argument. Uh, yeah, well, that, that's the kind of thing that brought me to this mm -hmm. thesis. And uh, the um, fact is, of course, that that was very functional, as you were just pointing out, in fact, that was very functional uh, in stages of history where mortality was very high. It becomes extremely dysfunctional in times when uh, mortality drops down. Mm 
almost, not quite, but almost to the level of developed countries. In China, the expectation of life of 70 years is not all that different from the expectation in advanced countries of 75 or whatever. So is it no longer a selection advantage to have male dominance and high fertility? Well, that's a, a somewhat controversial point yeah. because uh, many Africans I've met uh, think that it is an advantage and that, uh, they, that uh, we in the West, I've certainly met this argument more than once, we in the West are trying to talk them into having fewer children uh, because we are afraid of their, of their increase. I suppose to be completely frank, that argument uh, is not entirely implausible because we are afraid of the currents of migration uh, that are threatened and that indeed the currents of migration that are actually occurring. That's especially true in Europe. I haven't met that so much in North America, either in the United States or in Canada, where migration is taken more calmly. But in Europe, in France, conspicuously, in Austria, conspicuously, this fear of migration from the third world, say specifically in France from North Africa, from Algeria, Morocco, and such places, uh, that, that fear of migration, the genuine hostility, uh, not to the individuals as, as people, but to the culture that the immigrants bring with them, the chador that the women and girls wear, that has excited a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, opposition, yes. So it may be that it, there's something dysfunctional about high fertility in the present context, but it still has a selection operating to it? Well, that's the, that's the point, yeah. Uh, a selection for dysfunction, that's a kind of a paradox. A selection for what you and I regard as dysfunction, yeah. Uh. <laughs> yes. The, the, uh, you know, it's always been the case that people thought of population, this was very conspicuous in the uh, 16th, 17th century in the age of, uh, of uh, mercantilism. Uh, it has always been the case that uh, masses of people uh, were an instrument of power and that if the people could be put to work by the sovereign uh, to uh, make whatever it was, textiles or whatever, and those could be sold, then the sovereign was going to be better off. And it was not until the economy became freed and the, the population was not the property, as it were, of a sovereign, that uh, Malthusian notions became popular, it came to be. So, so uh, this notion that uh, having a lot of people is an instrument of power uh, is uh, not entirely disappeared from the third world. Uh, we, we don't think it's very enlightened. I certainly don't think it's very enlightened, and it involves consequences, uh, you know, uh, the consequence of overpopulation that are neglected by those who promote it so that uh, they're really working against themselves. But there's still the impression among many in the third world, luckily not a majority, a longer majority, uh, by which uh, people are a source of power. Well, is that necessarily only in the third world? What about the first world, places like uh, Belgium, where there's the Catholics and the Protestants represented in the legislature or something That's like right. that? So there's, there's a question of competitive numbers there, too, isn't there? Uh, this, this could apply to national minorities. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, and to come closer to home, in Canada, mm -hmm. it, it was felt for 200 years that there was going to be la victoire des berceaux for the French, the victory of the cradle, that was spoken of a great deal until, until the collapse of uh, French fertility. I was just reading a, a book by Professor Georges Mathieu, uh, uh, le, le, le Choc, uh, Le Choc Demographique, I think is the name of it, the demographic shock, that all of a sudden, and perhaps the, the sharpest fall on record, uh, occurred in Quebec just after the first, after the Second World War. And, and uh, the French were 
very bothered by this. Well, and still are, and still are. Uh, so that I can't, I can't assert that this is something that solely applies in, in history, mm -hmm. but it's a way of thinking that is not entirely disappeared. And, and perhaps with some reason, apparently, uh, there may be something to it. Uh, uh, I suppose you need a critical mass to maintain a culture, to maintain, in the case of French Canada, to maintain this culture of French Canada. If the population is in steady decline, there will be demoralization. On a local level, you know, it's still true. A city that's growing uh, has many advantages for people in it. I'm not speaking only of the morale of citizens, but if it's growing, uh, land will become worth more, Your, if you own property it will become worth more, uh, there will be uh, more, uh, just, just more wealth around with more people. So that uh, I suppose that the local enthusiasm for growth is certainly to be found in but those places import their people. It's not a uh, natural increase, right? And, uh, and perhaps there's a counter argument that you could uh, have low fertility and no male dominance, and by virtue of your technical and economic superiority, you can import the people that you need to keep prosperous and growing and gradually just sort of convert them all to your way and that your culture will survive even though it's somebody else who's having all the babies. Uh, now you're talking in an enlightened fashion, <laughs> which, which I was not doing up to this moment. That's right. I was saying what, what residue of ancient and presently really unsuitable uh, thinking about this matter mm -hmm. survives. Now, is there, is there a necessary link in either direction between male dominance and high fertility? That is, can you have male dominance and low fertility? Can you have high fertility without male dominance? Just to think about that connection for a yeah. second. Well, undoubtedly, there are cases where that occurs. But on the whole, the, uh, having the males in charge, as it were, when, when the men are, are in charge, man is the boss in the family, and the wife is at his disposal. And that certainly applies conspicuously in a country like Iran, for example. Um, uh, then uh, fertility is high, and this is not something I'm just saying, it is the case. So that we're talking about an empirical fact that where you go around the world, in most instances where where males dominate, then uh, you find uh, you find more children are born, mm -hmm. uh, and it uh, is attributed. See, relating it to income really doesn't work quite as well. Uh, it, certainly, that when people get to be very rich, they tend to have fewer children. But on the whole, it's much more conclusive to relate this low fertility to education, including education of women. And that certainly is associated with, uh, with uh, freeing the women. I mean, changing the power. Changing the power, that's right. Mm -hmm. So there, there apparently is some linkage between high fertility and male dominance. Now what about the connection between high fertility and the survival of cultures? Is there any necessary connection there? Uh, do you have to have high fertility for your culture to survive? And by the same token, is high fertility a guarantee of cultural survival? Right. In a way, you could say that uh, Western culture is now spreading around the world in many, many regards. Uh, the English language and many other aspects of our culture, uh, despite the fact that our numbers are limited and uh, likely to actually decline. So, uh, yeah, I go with your point that you could certainly have uh, a spreading culture and low fertility, obviously. Yeah, you're converting other people. In historic times, though, I'm inclined to think that, that it was the high fertility there was less communication, there was less exchange, and by and large, high fertility meant that people would 
migrate outward from the group. Uh, the Greeks again. Uh, expand their borders. Expand their borders. And they would carry with them the culture. And they would uh, not only apply the culture themselves, but they would, the culture would, if it was a, a convincing and effective one, would diffuse to other peoples among whom they spread. So I think that uh, you, you have to regard the mere numerical facts of population increase as having a very great importance in times before we had modern communication and exchange. Yeah, it sounds like it's almost a matter of the permeability of the cultures That's one right. to another. That exactly. if, they're, if they're relatively sealed off and isolated from each other, then it really is numbers. And right. birth rates that will determine it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Have you heard very much for or against, pro or con, the ideas in these articles? Uh, what, what has been the general reaction in your, to your perception of, of uh, people to this article, to this argument? Yeah, well, it breaks down according to, uh, according to disciplines. Uh, economists will revert to the fact that uh, uh, you have a, a declining fertility uh, because the wife's, let us say, one of the very common arguments, the wife's time becomes more valuable when there is a demand for her labor as society uh, advances. Mm -hmm. And when her wife becomes more valuable, when, when her t time becomes more valuable, then uh, she finds that uh, raising a child is more expensive, so to speak, in opportunity cost. And uh, that has a certain status as an explanation. I, I, don't, uh, I don't deny that. But I also say, how come that as her time becomes more valuable, as she also, uh, say, finds time to watch television than the whole population yes, does? Yes, that's an interesting point in the argument. Yeah, and, and I, I find that uh, just seizing on this having children, seizing on this having children as a way of explanation uh, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, really, it doesn't really persuade me, as I say, unless you can tell me what's different between children and uh, watching television. So the economists haven't really bought into too much the, the notion of the cultural normative framework within which all these choices are being That's made. Right. They're That's still right. not converted. That's right. On that normative framework, uh, I was making the point the other day that uh, you have, uh, by and large, single culture trays are not what is diffused or selected for. By and large, it's collections of, of trays. That is to say, I find it very hard to imagine that there would be a diffusion of a culture that just said was just different in saying that you must have a lot of children, didn't have other kinds of thinking and characteristics that went with that. Mm -hmm. As I say, think of, uh, think of the Catholic religion, which is, uh, has been on the whole pronatalist. And it isn't only pronatalist, it's just a whole lot of other things that seem to go together in a kind of value system. And, and the selection is not for having children. I may seem to be correcting myself now, but selection is not just for having children, but selection for a value system of which having children is part. Is part. That's a, that's a uh, more inclusive way of putting it. Yeah, well, I think that's rather, rather important to think about it that way. Otherwise, the argument is a little unconvincing and it's a little mechanistic to think of we're just, people don't behave that way. They behave as part of a, they behave in a kind of a, a culture pattern, as it were, and the selection then is for culture patterns. Well, there's some comfort in the thought that perhaps our culture will survive even if we keep on with some low fertility. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your time.